Welcome to a phenomenal edition of Rebellion's Educational Series. I'm here with Commander Dave Baronic, who was a member of Top Gun, instructor there, He's an author of three different books, has really just led an amazing life, was actually in the film Top Gun, and is here to enlighten our audience today. Thank you so much, Commander. Hi, Alex. Thanks for having me uh, today, and thanks for that introduction. And one thing that I would also add is the way I got to be a Top Gun instructor was being a radar intercept officer, a Rio, in the F-14 Tomcat. And that was the kind of flying that I did through uh, most of my career. But I'll let you uh, get us started here. So the Rio, was that Goose's position from the movie? Sadly, yes, it was Goose's position. Uh, yes, when I was a uh, teenager and I wanted, decided I wanted to be a fighter pilot, uh, my eyesight went bad. And so in the U.S. Navy back in the 1970s, uh, uh, I was commissioned in 1979. Uh, you couldn't be a pilot if you didn't have 20-20 vision. And there was no such thing as LASIK surgery or anything. Mm -hmm. So I was a little bit distressed for a few months. And then I realized that this brand new F-14 fighter had two guys in it. And the guy in the back seat could wear glasses. Mm -hmm. So I shifted my goal to being a, a Rio in the F-14 Tomcat. Uh, it was still, it was still very competitive. It was challenging, and uh, and I loved it. Did you love the F-14? Were you very attached to that plane? Oh yeah, I did. The F-14, um, you know, it, it's got a, a fair number of fans. It's got some detractors, uh, like like all aircraft. It's not perfect. It can't do everything, but it was amazing, impressive, and. Well, you know, what was your what was your biggest misgiving? Wait, wait, look at this beauty. It's just beautiful. You know, it looks good. <laughs> no, it does look amazing. Uh, it, it's hard to not, you know, be impressed with the plane. So, what was your biggest problem with the plane? Uh, well, we had a couple of problems that I will say, and uh, they were cured in the final version of the F fourteen. Uh, one of the um, one of the most well known problems was that the engines probably they could have used more thrust. And that's because uh, the engines that were put into the majority of F-14s are originally they were, they were planned to be just tentative engines. They were, you know, interim engines. But the Navy uh, never broke free with the money to improve uh, the engines in most of the Tomcats. So we flew with these interim engines, uh, you know, and that's all the versions that I flew all had that, uh, that original engine. Now, as a lot of pilots recently have said, it's like, look, the engine worked. You know, I flew the plane, I did the best I could with the engine, and I did a lot of great fighting. And uh, so don't use that as an excuse. Well, they could take off without a ski jump. So that's that's impressive in itself. Yeah, but they did need a catapult from uh, an aircraft carrier. So uh, they, they had to hook up to a steam catapult and take off. How uh, much so of the force would you say came from the catapult versus the plane? 50-50? 37. Oh, no, most, most from the catapult. That really? catapult will, it will fling. I mean, even if the airplane had no power on, the catapult will give it a good fling. It's not going to fly very far, but it'll, it'll throw it. So really those catapults were very powerful. And you had once had a bad mishap with landing your F-14. I did. Um, we were coming into land on the aircraft carrier. We we're in the middle of the Indian ocean. May I ask which carrier? USS Constellation. Thank you. Okay. It was uh, number 64. The uh, date was December 19th, 1981. Uh, my pilot and I were coming into land. It had been a great flight, a routine training flight. Everything was normal. Where, where was this exactly? The middle of the Indian Ocean. Okay. So what, what country were you closest to at the time? Nothing. We were thousands of miles from everything. I mean, right out there in the middle. Yes. Uh, kind of near Diego Garcia, which is the little island out there. I don't know Diego Garcia. Where is, where is yeah. that? It's right in the middle. I mean, it's, Alex, believe me, it's, when I look at a map, you know, the Indian Ocean. So we're talking like about this. Antarctica. We're talking not so far off from Antarctica. No, no, we're up near the equator. Okay, okay. So you really are just the absolute middle of nowhere. Yes. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. The um, the arresting cable, and you can catch any one of the four cables, and it'll bring you to a stop. We happen to catch the number four cable. It wasn't set to the correct weight. They're supposed to adjust the weight for the type of airplane coming in. And uh, there was a series of failures. And this is a case study in itself, uh, what led to these series of failures. But we caught the one cable that wasn't set to the correct weight. 
Uh, we caught it, it slowed us down, and then all the machinery broke and the cable broke at both ends at the same time. So we went rolling off the flight deck at about uh, 50 miles an hour. Wow. Uh, my reaction was very interesting. I mean, to me, thinking back, uh, have you ever been in a car accident, Alex, or, or a stressful situation like that? I have been in a few car accidents. Okay, so did you experience a time distortion where, where things seem to slow down and stuff like that? Yes. Okay, so that happened to me at this time. I was thinking a million things or not, well, certainly a dozen things. And my hand was on the ejection handle that's located on the front of my ejection seat. And, uh, and we, as we go down the flight deck, I'm thinking, do I pull this handle? And I said, if I, if I pull this, there's no turning back. And as we got to the end, my pilot, who is the uh, squadron commander, Bill Switzer, he had been a Blue Angel. He had been uh, flown combat in Vietnam. He goes, eject, eject. Well, as soon as he said E, I pulled the handle. When I say the handle, it was just like this right here. I, mm. It's on the front of my ejection seat. I pulled it. The canopy came off. Our seats rocketed out. Our parachutes opened up. How high did your seats go? Uh, well, normally they would go about uh, 80, maybe 80 to 100 feet. But in our case, the plane was falling down when the seats fired. So my seat went as high as the tails of the airplanes on the carrier because because there was a downward vector it had to mm -hmm. overcome. Understood. So I came down. I got one swing in my parachute, splashed into the water. Yeah. And then the, the uh, pilot went skipping across the water. What do you mean, skipping across the water? His parachute didn't open. This The plane was falling. It tilted. He went skipping across the water in his seat. I mean, whether or not he actually, he didn't skip like a stone, but mm. he did splash yeah. and ended up. I got tangled up in my parachute because I was, uh, because I was coming straight down. My parachute opened and fell on me. So I tried to back out of my parachute. I had to use my uh, switchblade to cut myself out. This is the actual switchblade I used that I, I kept from my survival gear. Were you worried about drowning? Was that your first worry? I was worried about drowning. That's a that's a very good question. And, and uh, was your suit heavy? Did it? I mean, how, how was your suit buoyant or was it heavy? Was my uh, seat or my suit? So, was your suit? Was your suit oh, uh, buoyant? No. Okay, so of course we were eject. We were separated from the seats. I was separated from the seat. The one thing that I had going for me was as soon as I hit the water, we had an automatic life preserver. And mine inflated automatically and popped me up. And it's a large, very buoyant life preserver. So that kept me up. But I was also aware that that parachute will fill with water and will drag you underwater. Yeah. I mean, it, and, and aviators have died from this. And, and we knew about that in our training. So I had cut myself out of my parachute. I did uh, think about drowning very briefly, but I'm proud to say that I, that I said, you know what, that's not a productive thought. And I was able to put that out of my mind. Uh, one thing that helped me was the helicopter. They, they're the helicopter flying around the carrier at all times. Uh, whenever there's flight ops, the pilot saw our plane go in and he flew right over and was on top of me in uh, a matter of moments. Really moments. Yeah. So well, I mean, he, yeah. he first flew right. I mean, he flew over me within, uh, you know, a minute probably or less. Um, and then I gave him a thumbs up and they flew away. And I go, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm, I want to be pulled out. So what, but what they did was they went over to see the pilot. So that's why they flew away from me. They looked at the pilot and, and he was uh, behind me and he could see me. He wasn't tangled in his parachute. So he waved them back over to me. So they came over, they dropped a cable with a harness on it. Uh, I hooked myself up and uh, they, they pulled me up. Jumping back to Top Gun and to yep. Goose's character, could uh, Tom Cruise's character have uh, pulled out of that, uh, you know, uh, crash? Uh, yes, that, that, that spin that uh, became so famous in the movie. Well, uh, the F-14, due to the fact, and, and I mean, I think it's due to this fact, the fact that its, uh, its wingspan is almost the same as its length. So once it gets into a flat spin, uh, due to inertial forces and aerodynamics, 
it is very difficult to get it out of a spin. Uh, a few pilots have successfully pulled it out of a spin, but um, I would say many more uh, have not. And is so, there a particular maneuver to get out of a spin or is it really just, you know, feeling and natural? No, no, there, there's a, there's something called an emergency procedure, a bold fade procedure. I still remember some of it. If you get into a spin, it's stick forward, neutral lateral, like your harness, rudder opposite, tornado yaw. And then there's all these steps. And, and I still remember them, even though I haven't flown in uh, more than 20 years. Hmm. And, and that was the spin. That was the spin that JFK Jr. went into in 1997 when he crashed. Uh, I don't remember exactly. I don't think so. Uh, he yeah. had some kind of, uh, yeah, I don't remember the details of his mishap. He had turned left when his, when he was already turning left. So he did a double left, which then, um, cause he, you know, he, he had lost, he, you know, he didn't have a uh, flight instrument training. And so yeah. he, he didn't know that his vector was turned and that, you know, he was turning left and then he turned left again. And then, uh, I, I don't think job. he would have been in the same flat spin that the F-14 was in, but, but I'm not certain. Yeah, he might have just gone down like a, a butter knife. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, nevertheless, uh, so tell us about Top Gun. You must be very proud of the organization and uh, yeah. you have some opinions on the training standards. You know, Alex, uh, in, inside, I've, I have felt proud of being a, a Top Gun instructor. I mean, I'm wearing one of my Top Gun shirts. Uh, I joined the staff as an instructor uh, when I was uh, 26 years old. Mm. Um, so I was, I was pretty young in my life. I'd been in the Navy um, uh, seven years, which was, or excuse me, 1984. I'd been in the Navy five years, and that was the normal, mm. you know, five or six years. Uh, but most of the instructors are in their um, late 20s. Uh, we worked very hard. And one reason we worked hard was that uh, the school has high standards and all instructors work to meet those standards. And uh, I think that is one thing that has helped Top Gun to be uh, successful over the years and to maintain its reputation. Um, do, do you get the arrogant pilots that you know, Tom Cruise portrayed or not really? Uh, you, you know, Tom Cruise's character was exaggerated to make the movie more entertaining. Of course. Uh, yeah. We had, uh, that's one thing you learn when you're, when you are an instructor, when you're a new instructor and you're learning how to give lectures and you're learning how to uh, lead flights. Every once in a while, one of the other instructors will, will pull something like that on you. They'll be arrogant or they'll ask you a stupid question or something like that. And they'll help you figure out how to handle it so that once you're a qualified instructor and you're dealing with a class, you know how to deal with people like this. But I have to say that, uh, the vast majority of the of the pilots and, and now the Wizos who go through Top Gun, uh, they're mature. Yeah, they're confident, but but they know they're a little bit more mature than the characters in the movie. Gotcha. You also flew an F five, right? Yes. When I was an instructor, we flew uh, we flew the school had the A four Skyhawk, which is a small airplane. I don't. Can you show our audience? Yet. I know you've got that great model. Yep. Yep. When I was an instructor, the school flew the A four Skyhawk. And then they also had uh, several F5 Tigers. Let me see if I can hold this up. I'm looking at my camera. Awesome. No, that's great, Commander. Yeah. The F5 was a small airplane. It was designed by the United States as an export fighter. And it was used by the Navy, Air Force, and the, the Marine Corps as an adversary aircraft. And so when I was at Top Gun, we had some uh, single-seat F5Es and two-seat F5Fs. And how fast could uh, they go? Well, overall, the uh, their top speed, I believe, it was about 1.8 Mach, which was uh, right around 1,000 miles an hour. Uh, overall, they were inferior to, inferior to the Tomcat. I mean, it wasn't designed to do all that stuff, but it challenged the Tomcat where, where Top Gun, where it needed it the most, and that was in the close-in maneuvering fight. Mm. Gotcha, gotcha. So how do you feel about supersonic flight today? Do you expect that to come back? Uh, you know, I, I live in uh, on the space coast of Florida. We had a, a company that was started up here that was going to build supersonic aircraft. So, so I spent a little time thinking about that. Uh, that company has gone has gone uh, out of business, unfortunately. But I I've uh, seen recent uh, news about other supersonic aircraft. Yeah, Boom has their contract with United Airlines for. Yep. Some exactly. Yep. Yep. Uh, that's the one I was thinking of. Uh, I got to be honest with you. I'm. I'm skeptical. Uh, I am not a visionary on these things. I, you know, I haven't done studies, 
but to me as just a, a, a passenger i um you know i don't i know it takes six hours to fly from the east coast to london and i don't know if i would pay a lot more to make that trip in four hours you know just just mm -hmm. a marginal decrease in time but what about the actual feel of the trip would you notice a difference between you know 1.8 mach versus you know 600 miles an hour no, that was one thing that we noticed in the F-14. Uh, at, at most uh, supersonic speeds, uh, there's very little difference, especially up at higher altitude. Um, now, there were a few times in my career when I was uh, doing high speed at uh, lower altitude, 1.1, 1.3 Mach. So not even the high Mach numbers, but at low altitude, that takes a lot of energy to push through the thick atmosphere. And let me tell you one cool thing that I saw. One time when we were at the end of a dogfight, we're leaving the dogfight, pilot went to maximum throttles, went into a dive just to get away from the scene. And I'm in the back seat, I'm looking behind us to make sure no bandits are chasing us. And yeah. I turn around and I saw a shockwave moving back on the canopy. Mm -hmm. And it was like a piece of glass sliding back on the canopy, purely due to our high airspeed, just a clear piece of glass. It wasn't that that cloud that you sometimes see, this was a, a, a shockwave. But the fact is that uh, when you're at that high speed, I mean, there's a little bit of increased noise from the, uh, the canopy rail and, and, and the air conditioning even, because everything's operating at uh, maximum, but uh, it's not really a significant feeling, uh, especially if you're up at higher altitude. Hmm. Awesome. So you, you talk about these bandits, uh, do you feel that country, other countries can rival the United States' Air Force? Uh, I think that our uh, forces, all of our Air Forces, Air Force, Navy, and the Marine Corps has fixed wing aircraft also. Uh, they train that we're, we're fortunate that they uh, train a lot. Our forces train a lot. Uh, our country is fortunate. We have a, a strong economy. We have good resources. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, we realize that a strong military is effective as a stabilizing and deterrent force. Mm. And we, you know, I, I don't want to get into the preaching thing, but I'm, I'm saying that all these things are very conscious. And uh, we, we put a lot of effort into training. So uh, we're among the best in the world. Mm. Certainly, there are other countries where they have, uh, you know, they have uh, talented pilots. And, and luckily, I think most of those countries are our allies. Oh. But there's a few countries that are potential adversaries, and they have talented pilots, and they have good equipment. And so you, it's difficult to dismiss anybody that can get in a plane and uh, fly. Of course. No, no, very good point. This has been an awesome conversation, Commander. Before I let you go, I'd love for you to show our audience uh, you know, two of your books that are make for awesome Christmas presents or holiday. Okay, thanks, Alex. Yes. Uh, my first book was Top Gun Days. Mm. It describes in more detail that ejection uh, that I talked about earlier. That's chapter mm. five. But it, beyond that, in terms of substance, it describes uh, about the Top Gun squadron, what it was like to become an instructor, some of the principles that Top Gun follows. And uh, of course, there's a lot of flying adventures in there too. I mean, I, I oh. talked about the challenges and the demands but we were flying around in jet fighters, dogfighting all the time. Then awesome. my new book is called Tomcat Rio. It's a larger uh, format. I mean, it's still mostly text, but the pictures are bigger. And it talks about uh, my experiences later in my career, including command of an F-14 squadron. Yeah, no, you commanded almost a, a billion dollars worth of uh, airplanes. Four, 14 no. airplanes are worth uh, roughly <laughs> 700 million at the time and about no. 300 people. And it was... Uh, it was uh, a rewarding, but also a challenging experience. Uh, I feel very fortunate that I got to do that. Well, I feel very fortunate we had you on today. And Commander, thank you so much for your service to this country. Uh, we owe you a huge set of gratitude and I hope our readers will check out your books. So uh, have a wonderful wow. uh, week. I've enjoyed talking to you. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me and best of luck to you. Oh, pleasure is all ours. Best of luck to you as well, sir. All right, see you.